I want to talk to you about trusts and what trusts are about and why they have become so popular these days. But to tell you a little bit about trusts, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the probate process because many trusts are designed to avoid that process. At my office, I plan estates and also settle estates. And so every day of the week, someone will come into the office and they will want help probating a loved one's will. Whenever they come into the office, I always get two questions uh, when it comes to the probate process. And you might be able to guess what those are. First is how long is this gonna take? And the second is how much is this gonna cost? Those are the two questions I always get. Every probate is different, but every probate takes anywhere from several months to several years to complete. There are often multiple court filings and every time a document gets filed, it has to get stamped. It typically will go to the law clerk. If everything looks good, the law clerk will give it to the judge. The judge will sign it. It'll go back through the processing department before it's finally available for the family that's involved. And those things simply just take time. Often I hear from people that will complain about things like attorney delays, delays from the courthouse and the processing of the paperwork, delays from financial institutions and other title companies that may be involved, delays if people involved in the process aren't being proactive. If there's one party that's not in complete agreement with how the process is going, they can file what we call in Georgia a caveat, and it basically will shut down till court hearings can be had, and the judge will have the hearing and then make a decision and force the probate forward. And so really, those things take anywhere from months to years to complete. Most of the people I talk to say that, you know, this just simply takes too long. The question regarding cost is also a difficult one. Every probate is different. You've got different errors, you've got different issues, different underlying assets, just different complexities. Over the years, I've seen many ranges of probate costs. So once you factor in things like uh, court costs, maybe attorney's fees, maybe the executor will be compensated, other miscellaneous costs, anywhere from 3,500 to 15,000 or more. In some cases, I've had some that have gone longer than that. And if you happen to be a married couple, you might have to go through that process twice. You know, it's when the first spouse dies and then when the second spouse dies. And so if you happen to own property in another state, you might have to go through it three times. We call those ancillary probates. But oftentimes when people come into the office, I can tell you this, when they have to go through the probate process, they never leave happy, unfortunately. It's just something that nobody wants to go through. And so that's why trusts have become so popular these days because trust, while a will, will help you go through the probate process. It will help you navigate the probate process. Trusts are often designed to avoid the process. So let me tell you a little bit about what trusts are. Years ago, they were kind of perceived as something that only the wealthy would have. But these days, a lot of people are just using trust to enable themselves to keep control over what they have while really avoiding many government intrusions like the probate process. I always use this example when I'm describing to people what trusts are, and, and I change their name because although Atlanta is one of the major cities in the United States, it is a small community, so I always change their name in case anybody happens to know who these people are because I talk about their family, and I just change their names to John and Jane. and so. Many years ago, uh, I started representing John and Jane, and when they came into the office, I asked them the same thing that I ask everybody that comes into the office, which is, what has prompted you to want to get your affairs in order? Whenever I ask that question, I always get a lot of different answers. For some people, they just want to make their estate settlement simple. Others want to avoid the probate process I was just telling you about. Uh, others want to avoid things like nursing home poverty, you know, some want to avoid taxes, some want to make their children's inheritance divorce proof, some couples are concerned because they are in a second marriage situation. There's really an endless list of valid concerns that people have when it comes to getting their estate in order. But when John and Jane came in and I asked them that question, Jane really emphasized that she wanted to make things simple for her family. And the reason it was important to Jane is because her mother had died a few years earlier. 
her mother had a will like a lot of people and the mother had named Jane's brother as the executor of the will. Uh, every will needs an executor and, and Jane's mom had uh, named Jane's brother as the executor. Well, he selected a buddy of his to be the attorney for the estate. And Jane said that things were just moving slowly. It was difficult for her to get access to information. And she really didn't want things like that to be that difficult for her, her family, or her children. She just really emphasized wanting to avoid that probate process. She further mentioned that you know they had three children and, and what they really wanted was that they wanted that when one of them passed away, everything would pass on to their surviving spouse and their surviving spouse would stay in control of, of all the family assets. And that when the both of them had passed away, they wanted the assets to just be quickly, easily uh, distributed to their three children equally. But they specifically mentioned that they wanted their daughter, Linda, to be the one that was in charge of everything once both of them passed away. They said that Linda was the one that lived closest to them. She was the one that knew the most about their financial affairs. And the way they described her is that she was just a mature and responsible adult child. So we ended up setting up what we call the John and Jane Revocable Living Trust. And the primary reason we established this trust for John and Jane was because they both knew that if there were assets titled in their name, even if they had a last will and testament, that those assets would have to go through the probate process. Typically, those assets get frozen, and their heirs would have to typically hire a law firm and go through the probate process to unfreeze those assets and release them to the surviving family members. But what they also knew was that if they set up a trust and the assets were titled into the name of the trust when they passed away, that none of their assets would be frozen and that the surviving family members would have continued access to those assets and that the family member or members who were designated as the trustee would be able to make distribution to the heirs at the appropriate time without having to ever work with lawyers, judges, or the courts. And so let me tell you a little bit about what that trust looked like, which assets needed to be titled into the name of the trust to avoid the probate process. We'll talk about what happened when John passed away a few years after we established the trust, and then I'll let you know what happened when Jane passed away just a few years after that. So as I mentioned, the trust was named the John and Jane Revocable Living Trust. And the trust that we customized for them said a lot of things, but mainly it states that John and Jane would be able to do whatever they wanted to do with their trust assets as long as they were alive. They could buy, sell, manage, donate. No restrictions were put on John and Jane during their lifetime. They were in complete control of everything. Uh, the trust also said that when one of them died, that the surviving spouse stayed in control of everything. Nothing changed, neither the children, um, the children's spouses, and nobody was involved when the first spouse died. Things stayed in place for the surviving spouse. Now, after both spouses passed away, as I mentioned, John and Jane designated in their trust that Linda would be what we commonly refer to as the successor trustee and the three children, Linda included, would be equal beneficiaries of the trust. We call them beneficiaries instead of heirs of the trust when John and Jane passed away. So to make the trust work effectively, certain assets had to be titled into the name of the trust. First, all of the real estate owned by John and Jane would be titled into the name of the trust. And these transfers were recorded down at the local courthouse so that that real estate could avoid going through the probate process. Now, John and Jane also had an investment account. Once the trust was signed, it was simple for them to just title the investment account into the name of John and Jane as trustees of the John and Jane Trust. That way, when one of them or when both of them passed away, that investment account would not be frozen and the family members would be able to distribute it out. Now, 
Other types of probate assets that typically get titled into a trust, they include, you're gonna know a lot of these, they include things like certificate of deposits, other real estate interests, like mineral rights or gas rights, things of that nature. Individually held stocks, things of that nature. Now, John and Jane had things that didn't have to be titled into the name of the trust. We call these non-probate assets. For example, John had an IRA and he named Jane as the primary beneficiary of the IRA. After John died, Jane just simply produced his death certificate to the financial institution where the IRA was being held and the financial institution immediately transferred John's IRA into Jane's IRA. And so no probate, no lawyers, no courts were required for this transfer of assets from one person to the other. Now, other types of accounts that permit you to name a beneficiary, these include, and you're gonna know a lot of these, these include things like 401k accounts, life insurance policies, annuities, things of that nature. So it was probably about three years after we set everything up for John and Jane that we got that call from Jane who let us know that John had died the previous week. When she called, I can remember that she was pretty worried because she wanted to sell her home and move closer to Linda. Linda had some children of her own and, and Jane just wanted to move closer to Linda and her grandchildren. She mentioned that there was a neighbor who was providing comfort to her over the previous week because the neighbor had lost her husband a few years earlier and she was really just helping Jane through that tough time. Well, Jane was worried because the neighbor had told her that it'd probably be a year or more before Jane would even be authorized to sell the home. But we let Jane know that what her neighbor did not know was that since John and Jane had set up the trust, and they had put their home into the trust that no probate proceedings were going to be necessary. We reminded Jane that since we had created her trust and transferred her home into the trust, that she could sell the home immediately. And we told Jane that if she found a buyer for the home that afternoon, she could sell the home that afternoon. She was relieved to know that she wasn't going to go, have to go through that probate process and she did end up selling the home pretty quickly and she moved into an assisted living facility very close to Linda. And Jane ended up living for another couple of years after that. But it's probably about three weeks after Jane had passed away that we had gotten the call from Linda that Jane had passed away. And we asked Linda whether she had any concerns that we needed to talk about regarding her parents' estate. And Linda had said something like, you know, it was really easy three or so years ago when dad passed away. Mom really didn't have to do anything at all. You know, she continued to have access to all of her accounts. She was able to sell her home quickly. She ended up moving closer to me. Things really just happened very easily for her mom. Uh, but now that her mom had passed away, Linda was concerned about one of her two brothers. She said that this brother knew that her mom and dad put her in charge of selling their estate and their trust and that he called every day, sometimes twice a day, demanding his share of John and Jane's investment account. They had about a $600,000 investment account and, and she said, listen, I know it's only been a couple of weeks since mom passed away, but I don't know what to do. He's really just driving me crazy. Well, I told Linda that if her mom had left that investment account in her own name, then it should have to go through a probate process that I, I so often have to help people through. And we'll often just you know bring the parties that are involved into the office and get them into an agreement on how everything's going to go. And we'd start the process by filing the court paperwork and making sure that the judge has everything necessary to approve the disbursements of the estate after all the estate costs have been paid. But since Jane had set up the trust, I told Linda the assets were titled into the name of the trust and that none of Jane's accounts were gonna be frozen and that she should immediately really just hang up the phone with us and call the financial institution where that investment account was being held and that if she would inform them that Jane had passed away, that sure that they would already have a copy of her trust in their records, 
that they would give her just immediate access to the account and that they would assist her in distributing the assets out to her and her two brothers, all, again, without having to deal with lawyers and judges and the probate process. So I do recall that that call from Linda came into our office on a Monday. It was three days later on a Thursday that she called our office to let us know that she had done exactly as we asked and she called the financial institution and that her mom's investment account had already been divided up between her and her two brothers and that things had gone really easily. And so I asked her about their relationship with the brother and how, well, how does the brother feel about getting everything settled so quickly and she says, you know, that he had actually called her that morning and because of the difficult time they've had since Jane had passed away, she really didn't feel like taking the call, but she decided to take the call and it was actually her brother calling to thank her for just getting everything settled so quickly. And what she had told me was that their relationship was getting tested, that it was her brother's wife who was concerned that he wasn't going to see a penny of in his inheritance and she made him call every day to try to get that inheritance and so now that the estate had been sold so quickly the brother had gotten his portion of his inheritance she really expected that the relationship was going to mend between her and what would be her sister-in-law, her brother's wife, because there wouldn't really be any reason for there to be any distrust in the family. And that's really what John and Jane would have wanted when they set everything up. Now, this whole concept that I've been talking to you about with John and Jane and the revocable living trust and the successor trustee and the beneficiaries, uh, we call that in legal circles the revocable living trust. And the primary benefit to John and Jane in setting things up this way is that when John died, Jane didn't really have to do anything at all during her time of loss. She was able to sell the home immediately. She maintained access to all her financial accounts. And then when Jane died, Linda was able to get access to all of the assets, was able to disperse them in accordance with the terms of the trust that we had set up for John and Jane, all without having to deal with the typical delays or difficulties or stresses or time or the thousands of dollars you often have to go through when you have to go through the probate process. And so that is called the revocable living trust. Now, there are all kinds of trusts out there. There's one that we have that is designed to avoid uh, nursing home poverty. We call that the Medicaid Irrevocable Trust. It gets called different things in different places, but typically it's an irrevocable trust, and we'll just put the name Medicaid Irrevocable Trust in front of it so you can sort of know what all of that is about. We have what we call asset protection trusts, and these are for people who perhaps they're in an industry that will spur a lot of lawsuits, like maybe they're a small business owner or maybe they're a physician or something of that nature. And so we help them use the law to protect their assets and really keep what they have so that their children and grandchildren can benefit from their hard work. I love that old saying that there's nobody above the law, but there's nobody below it either. So you know you can use what the laws are on the books now to develop an asset protection trust so that you can help protect what you have and provide an inheritance for your children and grandchildren. Speaking of inheritance, I have some families that come in and maybe they've got an over-controlling daughter-in-law or a not quite perfect son-in-law in the family. They're kind of concerned about their son or daughter and who they've chosen to marry and they want to help make that inheritance divorce proof. We'll put that into what we call a children's inheritance trust so that those assets are, are typically segregated from all of the assets that the daughter or son and the daughter-in-law or son-in-law have accumulated so that those assets will be protected from a divorce or, or creditors or things of that nature. We call those children's inheritance trusts. We also have what we call 2503C's minors trusts. We work with those from time to time when 
Do we have a minor who is getting a trust? And what it allows is a lot of flexibility when it comes to you've got a minor in the family and they're receiving an inheritance or maybe they're the beneficiary of a life insurance policy but they haven't reached 18 yet. The minor's trust will allow a trustee to uh, have some discretion in distributing some of those funds for the health, education, maintenance, or support. We call them HEMS, H-E-M-S. So that the minor can be taken care of, but they don't have a right to the entire funds. And you can imagine why you wouldn't want to give an 18-year-old uh, their inheritance outright. Um, so if they're a minor when they receive the inheritance, we call that a minor's trust versus a children's inheritance trust. Typically those are for adults who are already uh, well into adulthood. We also have people that come in because they have concerns about a special needs child. Maybe they need help with supplementing the needs of that person. That person may have some government benefits that they receive as a result of their special needs. And so we will set up what we call a supplemental needs trust and it's really designed to give them access to money without critically separating or critically having a negative effect on the government benefits that they receive. And so we call those supplemental needs trusts. We also have what we call special needs trusts, very similar to the supplemental needs trust, but we call it a special needs trust. And this is really just designed to accommodate the specific need that a person might have regardless of any type of government assistance that they might receive. Sometimes special needs children don't necessarily receive government assistance. So we'll set up special needs trusts so that there will be a trustee that can take care of them because they may not be so savvy with finances that the parents, you know, they may have concern in that area. So we'll set up special needs trust to make sure that they have that peace of mind that their children are going to be taken care of if something were to happen. So there are many different types of trusts. Those are generally the highlights at our office. As I mentioned, we settle estates. We help people go through that probate process when they come in with a loved one who has passed away with a will. But we also plan estates and typically we will set up a trust for somebody so that they can avoid that entire probate process. Sometimes people come in and the last will and testament works for them. Usually they're young adults who are married and have very minor children. Typically if you're older and your children are in their teens or they're in adulthood, we'll move to something a little bit more complicated, more complex like a revocable living trust or an inheritance trust or a minor's trust, things of that nature. And those, we tend to see those in, in people who are not new parents, for example. And so those are just some of the ways that we help people when they come into the office and they need help planning an estate. And one of the primary vehicles we use these days are trusts, and there are many different types of trusts. It really takes time to sit down with an experienced estate planning attorney to determine which one of those might work best for you. But if you want to make your estate settlement simple, you want to avoid the probate process, you want to help your children with a not quite perfect son-in-law or an over-controlling daughter-in-law, you have a special needs child that you want to take care of, uh, maybe you're in a second marriage situation. Those are the types of situations we will typically develop a trust to help people guide them through their life and give them that peace of mind that comes along with having their estate plan in order. We do that every day of the week and we would be glad to assist you in that as well.